Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asking myself why the Great War of 1914-18 has remained so central to our lives. The Second World War, of course, produced its crop of names, easy to remember, like punctuation marks. Dunkirk, the fall of France, the Battle of Britain, Alamein, Stalingrad, Normandy, <coughs> Dresden, Hiroshima. But somehow, those earlier 1914-18 slaughters, their geographical location so scarred into our historical conscience, are wounds that will not close. Or wounds whose terrible consequences cannot be erased. Ypres, Verdun, the Somme, have a doom-like quality that have fully retained their semantic origins. The very name of the Somme has an assonance which still fills us with despair. Just as Passchendaele, for the English, seems to include the very word passion, and French as well, the Somme is like somber, the funeral, funereal mood of the graveyard. Here, from Frederick Manning's, largely unknown but semi-autobiographical Her Private We, is a truly sinister description of British troops moving up to the Somme at night, marching through a tiny French village to the sadness and the consternation of the few French men and women still there. <coughs> Doors suddenly opened and light fell through the doorways and voices asked the soldiers where they were going. Somme, Somme, they shouted as though it were a challenge. Ah, no bon, came the kindly, pitying voices in reply. And that was an enemy to them, that little touch of gentleness and kindliness. It struck them with a hand harsher than death's, and they sang louder, seeing only the white road before them. Song, song. The name speaks of sacrifice on a monstrous, epic scale, the destruction of our youth. Even today I find myself catching my breath when Shakespeare's French king asks Henry V's army if it has passed the song. Semantics and linguistics have maintained the relationship of these men with us. Their language, their expressions, their horror, the very metaphors they use are contemporary. They are as if of now. They are our people, yours and mine. Here, for example, is the soldier poet Edmund Blunden describing the scene only a few metres from the front door of this building in which we're sitting tonight. This is what he wrote 96 years ago. One morning, dark and liquid and wild, Colonel Harrison and a number of us went off in a lorry to reconnoitre in Ypres proper and to visit the trenches we were to hold. The sad salient lay under a heavy silence, broken here and there by the ponderous, muffled thump of trench mortar shells round the line. We passed big houses, one or two, glimmering whitely, life and death. We found light come by the time that we passed the famous asylum, a red ruin with some buildings and ornaments still surviving over the doorway. There was in the town itself the same strange silence, <coughs> and the staring pallor of the streets in that daybreak was unlike anything I had known. The Middle Ages had here contrived to lurk, and this was their torture at last. We all felt this as the tattered picture swung by like accidents of vision. And when we got out of the lorry by the Menin Gate, that unlovely hiatus, we scarcely seemed awake and aware. Note how Blunden almost tricks us into understanding the sad salient, the ruined houses glimmering whitely, like the white road stretching out before the doomed British soldiers in Manning's book. The staring pallor of the streets, the accidents of vision, wonderful <coughs> expression, the unlovely hiatus. This is literature sharpened by fear and weariness. It seems extraordinary today that a woman wrote from the Western Front under fire. I can explain to you that many years ago in Antwerp, browsing through an antique bookshop, that's what we Middle East correspondents do when we have <laughs> work at, I found a two-volume painted edition of Margot Asquith's Diaries, published in 1937. She was the wife, of course, of the British Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. And she received permission, of course she did, her husband was the Prime Minister, to visit the Ypres front line in 1914. Few even realised that a woman did record events at Ypres at that time. <coughs> My colleagues of those days, they stayed in the shadows <coughs> with the generals. Margot went to the front, Margot Asquith was at the front. 
And here is her sad and painful description of the graves clutching the Ypres Cemetery and of the German bombardment of this city. The Ypres Cemetery will haunt me forever. No hospital of wounded or dying men could have given me a greater insight into the waste of war than that dripping, gaunt and crowded churchyard. There were broken bits of wood stuck in the grass at the head of hundreds of huddled graves, with English names scrawled upon them in pencil. Where the names had been washed off, forage caps were hanging, and they were all placed one against the other as closely as possible. I saw Tommy digging, and I said, who's this grave for? And he answered without stopping or looking at me, for the next one. Thin white lines of smoke, like poplars in a row, stood out against the horizon, and I saw the flash of every German gun. My companion said that if the shells had been coming our way, they would have gone over our heads. The German troops, he explained, must have come on unknown to them in the night. And he added he did not think that either the Belgians, the British, or the French knew at all what they were up to. So far as I can discover, this passage is the first indication <coughs> in prose during the Great War, the very first faint hint that chaos rather than order might decide the coming bloodbath. And it was a woman who spotted this. But again, we have that wonderful metaphor from the heart of British literary tradition of the shell explosion standing like poplars in a row. Interestingly, Guillaume Apollinaire, the French poet and great war poilu, found a strangely similar metaphor when he described shellfire near Nîmes four months later, in January of 1915. And then my memory would fade as a shell blooms bursting over the front line, magnificent, like mimosa in blossom. But these will be almost the only lines of poetry I am going to quote tonight. For I find with the passing years that the poetry of the Great War no longer seizes hold of me in the same way as the prose. Perhaps we have overused the poetry of Rupert Brooke and Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Perhaps like the first notes of Beethoven's Fifth or Handel's Water Music, I've read too many times of the corner of a foreign field that is forever England, of how everyone suddenly burst out singing of the gas victim with the froth corrupted lungs. It is as if the poetry has been used up for me to await another generation which might read it with freshness. I say might read it. I could say the same of the prose, and of this I shall speak more later. My own father, Bill Fisk, much older than my mother, was himself a soldier in the Great War, arriving in Arras on the Somme in August of 1918 as a second lieutenant in the 12th Battalion of the King's Liverpool Regiment. <coughs> Every year he would take me around the battlefields of that war, to the Somme, to Ypres, and of course to Verdun. He first brought me here to Ypres in 1956, when I was 10 years old. We stayed. Bill and my mother Peggy and me at the Old Tom Hotel, where I'm staying tonight. It, hadn't, it hasn't changed at all. <laughs> and I still remember the dining room filled with other First War veterans like my dad, men in their 50s and 60s, all gone now, of course, who would reminisce about this great human tragedy as if it was the greatest thing in their lives. <clears throat> and in historical terms, it probably was. Bill Fisk was filled with patriotism and a kind of bleak but soldierly sorrow when he toured the cemeteries around Ypres. In later years, when he understood the mendacity of General Haig and read in silence the growing number of books about those soldiers who had been put before the firing squad, his mood changed. Once, when as a very old man he was recovering from a cancer operation, I asked him the question that historians have still not been able to answer. What on earth was the Great War about? All it was, fella, he replied to me, was one great waste. The very words of Margaret Aston. <laughs>